Hello and welcome to Foresight. I am your host, Ken Weaver. Today we welcome the person who will be creating the new normal at a 200 plus year old institution here in Salem, Massachusetts. Linda Roscoe Hardigan, the new executive director and CEO of the Peabody Essex Museum. I'd like to say welcome, Linda, to the show. Oh, well, thank you so much, Ken, and I'm, I'm delighted to be here. It's just really fun to have this opportunity to talk to you. Well, we're, we're just as thrilled to have you, believe me. <laughs> so what, what I really like to get into today is, is how you got to where you are. What was the path you took? Wh where, where did it all start? And uh -huh. uh, I'm going to have to tell you that it really started with my family. I, I grew up, fortunately, in a family with parents who really believed in... Um, having opportunities for my brother and me to explore different kinds of things, and so that included art lessons. Nice. Uh, so I was taking art lessons at the local museum in my hometown, Scranton, Pennsylvania, huh. uh, even you know, in, in elementary school as a, as a fourth grade. So I grew up you know, taking elocution lessons, uh, ballet lessons, piano lessons. The piano lessons didn't go so well. <laughs> so you know, the musical inclination, not so much. Not so but, much. The, but the visual part uh, is also, I think, something kind of genetically in me on my mom's side. Um, a lot of quilters, a lot of hat designers, oh. you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as I went into high school, um, I was thinking, oh, gee, maybe I want to be an interior designer because my inclination um, in my private territory, otherwise known as my bedroom as I was growing <laughs> up, was really about rearranging things constantly right, right. and creating installations around holidays or my birthday or whatever. So my parents never quite knew what was going to happen when they opened the door because <laughs> you know, everything would be rearranged or decorated or things would have like disappeared from other parts of the house. So when I applied to college and I went to Bucknell University in, in Pennsylvania, I did apply as a fine arts major. And then I well remember the time when I was taking um, Art History 101, otherwise known as Art in the Dark, you know, like a big lecture hall with hundreds of people looking at a big screen and right. pictures of Renaissance art. And just oh. realizing that um, there was something about the history and the context and the experience of art um, that was likely going to be more meaningful to me. And I think you know, that was a real connection to the fact that even in high school I was volunteering in the museum across the street from where I lived. Oh. So um, I came out of college knowing that I really didn't want to teach, and no offense to teachers because they do um, incredible service, but it was just not going to be me, and right. it was that curiosity about working with objects. So I went to George Washington University in, in Washington, D.C. for my master's degree in art history. And <clears throat> the school offered this opportunity for a year-long internship in a museum. So I thought, okay, that's the way I'm going to find out if the museum environment is, is really for me. And I happened to intern at what was then called the National Collection of Fine Arts at the Smithsonian and is now the Smithsonian American Art Museum. So mm -hmm. I went into that internship thinking I was going to be a medievalist and I came out realizing that I was going to be, you know, much more involved with American art and modern and contemporary art. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I started as an intern, I'm fond of saying sort of like in graduate in uh, in kindergarten and then when I left the Smithsonian um, in 2003 to come to the Peabody Essex Museum for my first chapter, uh, you know, I had risen from intern to chief curator at the Smithsonian American Art Museum and, you know, spent a lot of time building the collection and the exhibition programs around things like African American art, um, contemporary art, art by women, um, art by Latino and Latina artists, um, simply because it was a national museum, but there were there mm. were people <laughs> and experiences missing from the fabric of that museum. So I, I felt very strongly about about broadening and deepening what American art was on the national stage. And certainly, and, you found that when you got here, I would think. Oh yes, abs right. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was it was interesting because as I was interviewing for the position of chief curator here at the Peabody Essex Museum. Um, and I started in February of 2003, right before the new Softy building opened. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I came from a very specific kind of 
um, expertise, if you will, in terms of sure. being an American art specialist. So PEM has this incredibly global uh, and um, you know long times arrow of a collection. So I kept asking during the interview process, like, you know, do you, are you sure you really want somebody like, like me? And um, I guess I have a reputation for being able to ask questions and to bring out the best in people. So that's really what they were after and that, you know, I didn't have to know everything about all kinds of art across the world. Right. But, right. Um, you know, I came and, you know, we had fun for a long time because I was here, as you know, uh, before mm -hmm. uh, until 2020 and, and then went off for another adventure at another museum. And now I'm here again for chapter two. <laughs> so in chapter two, there's there's or now there's been a new setup prior to you getting here of things that were that Brian Kennedy and your predecessor put in place. And as I asked him when he sat here with me, um, so you, there's a period of time that it takes in order to get all those ducks in a row in order mm -hmm. to show what is being done. So, how, so are you can you picking up basically where he left off, or are you changing that a little bit, or how does that uh, how well, does that work? Well, um, for the I mean, I started in late August um, for Chapter Two as as the director and. The, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to say that, you know, before I left, the new wing had opened, so I had been very mm -hmm. involved in all of the um, interpretation and presentation mm -hmm. of PEM's collection, including all the preparations for the um, South Asian galleries that opened right, right after I left, and uh, we're getting ready for the opening of our Native American and American galleries um, this winter. So I've been involved in all of those sorts of things. And now it's really because, you know, I realized that in moving to another museum, and I actually had moved to another country, Canada, uh, and the world has changed so much that, you know, I'm, I'm both annoyed and intrigued by this concept of normal and, and new, uh, because the, the institution has incredible legacy and um, collections and talent in its staff. And so now it's about, all right, as the world has changed so dramatically, how is it that we can work um, with our talent and our, our commitment to creativity and uh, openness and, and sharing? You know, how is it that we can more directly address the issues of our time right. uh, and yet also provide people with a sense of sol solace, you know, a coming together? Um, I know one of the things that the museum um, recently made more of a commitment to and that I'm going to continue is very much a commitment to the community and, and to the region in terms of being able to partner with other organizations and, and artists. Is there any specific art that you are attached to in any certain way or I mean I understand you love all art which yeah, is why sure. you, which is why you do it but but still when you go home what's hanging on your walls uh -huh. or oh, standing in the corner yeah, yeah. well I mean <laughs> as, as, a, as an art historian and a curator I mean I obviously have a real commitment to American art and, and mm -hmm. contemporary yeah. art and I've done a tremendous amount of work on self-taught artists in this country meaning those that didn't go to art school right. because creativity can come from so many different uh, places. Sure. In terms of art that um, and design that I live with, um, it's kind of all over the place in some respects. I'm very much into texture, so I love textiles oh. uh, and uh, I love industrial design and Fortuitously, I suppose, my mother and my aunt uh, never met a minor appliance they couldn't part with. Uh, so uh, I actually have a really interesting and good collection, apparently, of things like, you know, 1930s and 1940s coffee makers and waffle irons and toasters mm -hmm. and, and mixers that people are fascinated by when they come to, to visit. And I happen also to love photography. So um, there's a fair amount of photography that we live with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and in terms of another area that I'm really uh, committed to, it's also fashion and design generally, mm -hmm. um, having helped the museum really um, take fashion to a new level at the museum. And um, I would uh, 
not be bashful about saying that I love to shop, uh, but it's <laughs> about, um, you know, shopping creatively in terms of, you know, how do I create my look? How do I present sure, myself? Sure, sure. And, you know, what does that really project to people? But fashion's a really important part of my visual love. Are your glasses from the display uh, of... Oh, Iris Apple? No. Iris Apple? No. Okay. <laughs> no, but it's so, but it's really funny because... I had to ask that. Of, <laughs> well, of course. And um, when I look back at some of the pictures of myself over the years, I look at some of the glasses I chose and it's like, oh my God, what was I thinking? But at any rate, um, no, it's interestingly, when I went to the Royal Ontario Museum mm -hmm. in Toronto, um, I had, it, was, it turned out to be a primarily virtual job. I mean, the museum oh, closed right, and Toronto right. closed shortly after my husband and I moved there. So every morning, because it was all Zoom, it was basically, you know, which necklace, which pair right. of glasses, what's the color around my face? Yeah. Did because, I really do my makeup? Because they're only going to see yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, face, you, yeah. you have to really yeah. think about that sort of thing. Sure. Sure. In part because I never met most of the staff <coughs> at that museum, so it was about you know how do I project present, myself right, and, and right. present myself. First impressions are yep. always important. Yeah, and people do seem to love these red glasses. <laughs> <laughs> how is how is the uh, the projection of what the Peabody is going to be doing uh, aside from what the exhibits are going to be uh, influence the people of Salem? How do you how do you think that works together? Well, we've, we've had a, I think, really productive commitment to uh, working with the schools in Salem, mm -hmm. uh, as well as in Lynn and some of the surrounding communities. And, you know, we're actively talking now about how is it that we can have more of an impact. Um, we've, we're, I think we've now in our second class of um, interns or actually um, intern fellows um, from Salem High School. And mm -hmm. so trying to get involved, I think, with a, a broader spectrum of kids and children and young adults al along a different kind of spectrum in terms mm -hmm. of opportunities for them to experience a museum either as a work environment or as a creative environment is something that we're very much talking about. And I'm, I'm very proud of the fact that we've now instituted paid internships at the museum, because oh. oftentimes in museums, the um, internships have not been paid in the, right. in the past. Right. So that's a big step forward. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, you know, through our partnership with the House of Seven Gables, um, their ESL classes are taking place at the museum, and then um, the students have an opportunity to experience the museum as part of that. So, you know, slowly but surely, we're, we're building up a repertoire of of local partnerships and regional partnerships that I, I know and hope will will benefit um, you know the the citizens um, of Salem simply because it's important for the museum to be a responsible and responsive citizen in this community. Yeah, so I've, I've always wondered why so little attention had been paid to art classes in at the high school or elementary level when it is so important mm -hmm. for the creativity, for the opening of the mind, because it helps them think more, expands their concepts of life mm -hmm. in general. And well, you know, unfortunately, you're commenting on something that's happened across the country oh, yeah. um, for, you know, more decades than we might want to count, because mm -hmm. it also applies to performing arts programs and music right. programs and, and um, and it's and it's tough. I mean, I I know the benefit that I had as a child, either taking the cl the art classes in school or after school, um, of what that really did open me up to, as as you say, yeah. because you know, for the minute you decide to put pen to paper or um, you know brush to canvas, you're, you're making decisions. You know, you're ma you're making Quality. choices, and uh, that's an important thing to learn how to do because it is a form of communication. So, um, you know, we have, we've had great, um, I think, energy around even during the pandemic and having to go virtual, offering things online as virtual creativity mm -hmm. um, activities. And, you know, we're really looking forward to reintroducing Pem Pals, um, which was the every Wednesday morning uh, opportunity for um, caregivers, whether parents or grandparents or nannies, to come to the museum with children under the age of three and experience, you know, books and reading and, and art activities. 
So there's more like that that we'll do once we're really able to all engage um, more socially. Sure. The necessity for this is, is obvious. Um, and, but the implementation of it is sometimes what holds things back or what slows things down. How do you think that the PAM handles that implementation of either exhibits or as you were talking about bringing interns in and mm -hmm. is that is that is that working well or is that something that's just going to increase as time goes by to I am highly aspirational <laughs> which um, you know I think is a is a good thing um, mm. as long as it's tempered with a sense of you know discipline and sure. also understanding that um, people really have to work well together so there there's an extraordinary group of people working at the museum uh, in terms of their talent and, and their dedication and, and energy. So, um, you know, as in any sort of human organization, you have to pay real attention to how people are understanding teamwork, how they understand, are, are our processes clear? Right. Um, you know, sometimes processes can get too top heavy or really too nebulous. Right. So, um, you know, we've, we've started, you know, talking more as an executive team, even about, you know, what is it that we need to be doing better? And is, is there an off chance that we could do something better because we actually shouldn't be doing something else? Uh, you know, sometimes mm -hmm. when you're uh, very aspirational as an organization, you try to do everything, uh, right. and that oftentimes will affect the level of quality and, and, and you know, ability to even, you know, follow through. So sure. um, it's sort of um, a matter of asking ourselves to be disciplined about really checking ourselves, like how are we doing, mm -hmm. um, and then also from the perspective of others, how, how are we doing. Right. Um, Back when you were in college, mm -hmm. um, not so long ago, huh? as you as you graduated, yeah, it was four years ago. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, um, when when you so when you graduated from there, you went directly. I'm sorry to to graduate to school, graduate sure, graduate the George school. Washington University. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it, was, was there was there any particular person who or that said something to you or that showed you something that that really inspired you? I mean, to, 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 yeah. The can you speak the. To that? Um, you know, so I'll, st I'll step away from the from the family context because sure, there was certainly yeah. yes, you know deep influence there, especially my grand my maternal grandmother. But um, I will never forget two professors at Bucknell University, um, one of whom was rather petite and um, wiry, and he often stood in front of a screen, you know, just about as big as um, the backdrop that we, that we have here. And I'll never forget the day that he basically ran at the screen and hit it with a pointer to make sure that uh, we were really gonna pay attention to a detail. Mm -hmm. And because I'm detail oriented, it was like, yeah, you know, you really have to look closely and, and not mm -hmm. take some things for granted. Um, the other professor, um, Jerry Ager, was someone who really believed in what he called the art of the fantastic. And there's a whole tradition of, you know, eccentricity and spiritualism involved with that. Mm -hmm. But what he really opened me up to was um, there are many things that could be considered art and many different kinds of people can be considered artists. Um, not necessarily the people who get designated over time as masters. Uh, so mm -hmm. that was an important lesson in terms of being more democratically open to where um, art and artists can come from and, and take you. Mm -hmm. uh, and then certainly when I was an intern, I worked for um, a curator, uh, Walter Hopps, who was a legend in the art business mm -hmm. at that time, um, very much a maverick and uh, had an incredible way of, of looking at things and designing things. And um, the experience of working with him as a truly um, eccentric, demanding, and yet highly creative individual um, actually said to me that I could have the courage to be different uh, in terms of really being deeply, deeply involved in the combination of ideas and design because mm -hmm. he was just so visual. Mm -hmm. And you know, if he, he used to say, if people can't get through their eyes what you're trying to convey, then no idea, no fact, um, no concept is actually going to you know, penetrate. 
And mm -hmm. you know, that really has stuck with me over the years. Yeah, it's not everyone who can, who can imagine or who can see something through the vision that you, other people, artists, that artists have, mm -hmm. because they can be anything, mm -hmm. you know, so to be able to do that. Um, I've always thought that everything that man has, has made is a form of art mm -hmm. in one way or another. Yeah, absolutely. And I still think that way. Well, and I think that's one of the reasons why um, visitors often respond so deeply to works in, in the, the museum's collection, because much of what we have in the collection is not going to qualify for the Western notion of high art. Right. I mean, we have an, any number hundreds of thousands of things that, have, that were made for daily life in different cultures at different points in sure, time. And so sure. I think there's a, a kind of natural connectivity <laughs> or responsiveness that those kinds of ob objects have for people. Because uh, let's face it, many people don't even go to a museum because they feel like they're, they don't know enough. Uh, <laughs> right. or, you know, they don't know who the artists are or why, why it's important. Um, but I think if people can sense um, a relationship to everyday life and, and, and people's experiences, that, you know, that's, that's, that's opening the door real fast. Yeah, and you'll never understand what the art is trying to say if you don't go and look at it and try right. to get, you know, right. it's best to stand next to someone who knows what they're talking about so you can get a little <laughs> earful and say, oh, that's what that means. Yes. <laughs> well, and it can mean whatever you want it to mean, actually. Exactly, yeah, right. Sure. And a lot of artists don't actually like to be interpreted or they right. don't like to be asked. <laughs> right, uh, right, you know, so what does this mean? Yeah. What, or what did you intend tend for to me? To say, yeah. right. Yeah. right. <laughs> um, the American uh, um, Indians? Yeah. So we have um, actually the country's oldest um, collection, formed collection of Native American art. And so in March, I believe it is, we'll be opening um, our galleries on the first floor uh, and it, 10,000 square feet, so it's a lot. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And it's a combination of works by historical and contemporary Native American artists and historical and contemporary artists from the United States, uh, but not Native American. So okay. it's a real combination of things and it's our effort to weave um, the two experiences together. Uh, together. Um, had there other, I don't know how many Native Americans we have in Salem, have you, uh, is there any contact at all with local people or, the, or local the, tribes from anywhere well in Massachusetts? The, yeah, course. the yeah, sure. um, the curatorial and interpretive and, and design team have, have worked with um, our Native American fellows. We have a, I guess it's about 10 years now, a program where we offer um, fellowships to rising Native American professionals from around the country, right. oh, uh, you know, from from Massachusetts to Hawaii to to Alaska to the to the Southwest, and so they've participated in the development of the mm -hmm. project, and we have great ties with the Wampanoag communities right. um, on from Cape Plymouth. Cod yeah. and and you know um, south of of Boston, so. Um, a, a mix of um, people have really contributed to the interpretation. Oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah, being from upper state New York with all the, oh, yes. the Native uh, Americans that yep. we have there. Yeah. It's a gra great, great thing. Well, it's, it's, um, it's a part of our uh, history and our culture that's gone um, underappreciated and, and misunderstood for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. So. Um, one of our goals, of course, is to open up channels of, of better understanding in that regard. The storage unit that's uh, in Raleigh, center. I think. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that, that is open, or is that not open? The collection center is open by appointment, appointment yep. and so, but open to anybody by appointment. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we still got a lot of unpacking and, and oh, sure. rearranging to do and, and that sort of thing. And, you know, our library is there as well, and that's, um, that's open by appointment, and, and I think also sometimes more by drop-in simply because there's a reading room in it and we're able to accommodate people in, in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, but the, you know, the pandemic has um, 
you know, made it somewhat difficult for people to feel safe to go anywhere, sure, obviously. Sure. But we've also been helping people uh, learn about the collection by slowly but surely digitizing the collection so there's more and more that will online. be online. Um, oh, and then good. sometimes that means someone doesn't have to come to visit, and other times it means, oh, I really I got really to come there, see right? the real thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's yeah. good to know. Let's go back to Canada. Uh huh. That seems that seems. <laughs> I'm gonna interesting. have to go back for a vacation to experience <laughs> it. Well, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's a bittersweet story. I mean, I, I, my husband and I uh, moved there in early October of, of 2020 because mm -hmm. I was um, g taking the position of deputy director for collections and research mm -hmm. at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, and that's Canada's largest museum. It's it's often described as Canada's version of the Smithsonian. Right, and, right. you know, I think maybe four weeks after we got there, um, and we'd been t quarantined Whew. for two weeks of that, right, right. Uh, you know, the, the museum had to close, and it stayed closed until we moved um, away from Toronto June 29th, and that was tough. Mm -hmm. I mean, Toronto is a fantastic city. It's incredibly diverse. Um, for someone like me who's interested in fashion and design and right. shopping and, and good eating, um, it kind of killed me that all those stores and restaurants were closed. <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we got enough of a sense of um, the, the city, at least, um, that um, it's clear that um, Toronto and, and Canada just have just incredible resources and that more of us could know more about that. So, but I, my husband and I were particularly disappointed because they, they basically closed down Niagara Falls. I mean, we'd never seen Niagara Falls oh, oh. and took for granted that we were gonna be able to do that because we had assumed that we'd be going there and living and working there for a long time, but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it just didn't turn out that way. I lived in Rochester and Albany, New York. Uh -huh. So yep. I, know the, I know what it's like. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Remington Museum, do you ever, have you ever been there? That's up in Ogdensburg, New York? Uh, no, I have not. So is it dedicated a, to Frederick Remington, yes, the American it, sculptor? Yes, it is his studio, uh -huh. like you just walked out of it. Uh -huh. So everything is there. Yeah, and th those are fascinating environments to go into. Like if you go to the yeah, Hudson Valley to go to Thomas Cole's house yeah, and yeah. studio and mm -hmm, Frederick mm -hmm. Churches. I mean, it's, it's, it's fascinating to see how they lived and, and worked. So yeah. I'll have to put that on my list. Okay. Well, I think we're, we're getting to the end uh -huh. right now. And, and I just want to say thank you so much. And it's been such a pleasure to have you here. Linda Roscoe Hardigan. All right, and thank you so much. I'm, I'm just thrilled to have this opportunity to share and, and to get to know you. Thank you. Well, thank you. We'll see you again. You bet. Thank you. So that's the show from Salem Access Television. It's been a pleasure to have the, the new executive director and CEO of the Peabody Essex Museum, and we uh, hope to see you again soon. From now on, right now, and this is Ken Weaver saying goodbye until next time.